If you are in the process of grieving and you are dealing with extreme stress and feeling burnt out, then stay tuned because today's show is dedicated to you. Dr. Irene Kopp is with us today for our third episode in our mini series on grief designed to help you learn new skills and techniques to process challenging emotions and get back to living a life that you love on your own terms. Welcome to C60 Health Connections, where we meet with leading experts who can help you elevate performance in all aspects of your life. As founder of the Stress to Success Shift Institute, Dr. Irene Kopp helps purpose-driven high achievers shift from stress to success in all areas of life, their career and wealth, health and energy, relationships and personal life. Because of her own catastrophic burnout and near-death experience, Dr. Irene is passionate about guiding others in bouncing back from burnout as well as healing from trauma. Her comprehensive background and expertise spans both Eastern and Western medicine, holding dual doctor degrees as a medical doctor and doctor of chiropractic with extensive training in acupuncture, neuroplasticity, elite performance psychology, stress management, and resilience. Dr. Irene is globally is a globally sought after speaker neurophysiological meditation instructor, having helped over 155,000 people with her meditations on the app Insight Timer, and the host of internationally acclaimed podcast, The Stress to Success Shift. My name is Jessica McNaughton, and I am the CEO at shopc60.com and at C60 Purple Power. I'm a business executive with years of experience in corporate America, and for more than 20 years, I've been exploring various modalities in health, wellness, and spirituality. Now, before we get started, any statements, products, or remedies discussed today have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products or topics discussed today are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent, or mitigate any disease. Irene, so great to see you today. Thanks for having me today, Jess. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> will you will you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to this place in life where you are an expert in stress and resilience? Tell us a little bit about your your burnout experience and your and your near death experience, if you if you'd be so kind to do so. Mm. I'm I'm happy to help your listeners in any way, shape, or form I can, Jess. So again, thank you for having me here. So <laughs> the, the short answer is your mess is your message. The longer answer <laughs> is that years ago, I was physically burned out and didn't know it. I had developed a physical condition because of my chronic stress. And I hit the wall. Literally, my physical condition caused me to lose consciousness while I was driving. And I, the road kept, went around a curve, and I drove straight into a three story high, massive rock face that is very common in northern Canada. I broke 10 bones, had a mild brain injury because the engine basically ended up in my lap. I had to be cut out by the jaws of life. And that took a lot of time that I was needing to, to stay still, shall we say, while they did that, there was like fire in the engine. It was, um, it was quite something. And that's an understatement. That wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was that my two young sons were in the car with me. They were four and six. There were adults throwing up at the scene because of what they witnessed. And my six-year-old witnessed it all. So he basically automatically had PTSD. My four-year-old son suffered a catastrophic brain injury and had to be airlifted to the nearest 
pediatric hospital for emergency life-saving surgery. This was during the first SARS. So COVID is a SARS virus, but they call it COVID instead of SARS-2, just because they didn't want to get things mixed up. So this was during the first SARS. I don't know if you remember that, Jess, or not. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I was in a hospital all by myself on quarantine, lying completely flat because of all the 10 broken bones. More than the pain I was going crazy for fear for my sons. I couldn't see them. I couldn't talk to them. They didn't know for about three weeks, two to three weeks, whether my youngest son would even live. And in fact, for the longest time, they didn't even know that there was a mom in another hospital (laughs) because we had been taken that far apart. So I literally was spiraling down in, in fear and, and guilt and shame and remorse. Like, what kind of doctor was I not to have known? What kind of mother was I to almost kill my young sons? It's like, what kind of monster? Like, my inner judge and jury were just going crazy. Like, they tried and convicted me. It's like, you are an incompetent mother. You are a danger to them. You don't deserve to be around them. Like, it was just, it was truly the lowest moment of my life. And I remember very vividly the moment I was lying <laughs> in my dark hospital room, bawling my eyes out. I'm not a pretty crier like Demi Moore. And I was crying saying, why me? Why me? And yep, (laughs) true confessions, there was self-pity in there. And more than the self-pity was the truly the why me? Why did this happen to me? Because I did everything right. I, you know, I was a doctor. I, with more nutrition training than than most. So I ate right. I exercised as I got as much sleep as a mother of two young sons could. I was already a neurophysiological meditation instructor. I did yoga. In other words, I did everything so-called right. So why me was, why did this happen to me? And it was also why me, as in why did I survive? Because trust me, at that point, there was a big part of that, you know, the judge and jury that were saying, you don't deserve to live. And so I realized I had a decision to make because I recognized that I was simply a statistic, a statistic of one of hundreds of millions of people. And with COVID, we could say billions of people now who were under stress, chronic stress, burned out, maybe not even knowing it, and were either on that slippery slope to burn out or had already crashed and burned like I did. And it may show, might have shown up differently for them. It might have been a car accident like mine. It might be any number of ways that chronic stress can show up. And I'm happy to talk about that. But whether it's depressed immune system, causing cancer, causing autoimmune conditions, diabetes, heart disease, chronic pain and inflammation and disability. There are so many ways it can show up. And I was just one person. So I chose to give myself the grace that I would give any of my clients or patients or any of my friends or family and understand that I had done the best that I could and that there were unseen hidden factors that contributed to my catastrophic burnout. 
and that it was up to me that I was the perfect person with my education, my background, and now my personal experience and truly understanding what it was like to go through it to really find those answers and help as many people. If I could help one person, one family avoid the suffering that my family did, then I would be successful. And not to leave you and your listeners hanging, my sons are doing great. My youngest son, once they decided he was going to live, we were told that he would never walk again, he would never talk again, and he would not pass high school. He does both walk and talk, and he's in his fourth year of engineering. So that is the story of my background. Thank you so much, Irene, for sharing um, your your story and your in your journey with us. I'm I'm really moved, and I'm I'm really grateful because um, <clears throat> all of the the feelings that you described through your experience are, um, are, are really common emotions for, for a lot of people, probably most people in different scenarios. And, um, <clears throat> part of the reason why I was really interested in connecting with you today is because I, I feel like we've all gone through collectively, you know, this really intense global stress, strain, burnout and grief scenario over the last two, two and a half years. And it's just continuing to ratchet up. And so I do believe that most of us, um, whether or not we acknowledge it <laughs> or even understand what it is, we're dealing with some underlying low levels of that, that chronic stress, that burnout. And also we're all dealing with some sort of grief. Maybe we've lost people that we care about. Um, maybe our situations have changed and we're, we're grieving an old life. Um, maybe we're about to go through the grieving process when we're experiencing potentially $10, um, uh, $10 gas or, you know, $11 gallons of milk. And so it, it's, it's going to be really challenging for, for a lot of people here really soon. And so, um, <clears throat> I was really hoping, um, that you could talk to us specifically about, um, you know, what we might be facing here because potentially, you know, mental and emotional health could be, could be our next pandemic. And I feel like we, um, we could all benefit from understanding tools and techniques that we can utilize on a daily basis to deal with these challenging emotions. The fear, which has been heightened for everybody exponentially because of what MSM does on a daily basis. Um, you know, guilt, shame, remorse. Maybe you've made choices um, that you don't feel great about today. You know, so people are, are dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, and I loved, I loved how you talked about um, the thing that saved you was giving yourself grace. And I think that that's so important for friends and family and coworkers. Um, a lot of us have been um, divided over the last couple of years. And I think us bringing back in grace into the conversation and um, how, do, how do we do that along with self-love is a really important topic for us to kind of dive into. So um, can we just start with um, kind of how, how does stress show up for us um, as it relates to mental and emotional health. Mm. Thank you. And you made some brilliant, brilliant points. And you're so right. Conventional medicine is now saying that our mental and emotional health challenges are the next pandemic. Well, I have news for them. It's already here. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was already, as far as I'm concerned, a pandemic before COVID and it is, it's only spiraling out of control more and more and more. The American pediatric societies have actually declared a state of emergency on, on mental health in our children and adolescents. So it's, it, and it impacts us as adults too. So it's like, there's, there's no getting away from it that I, I will, I, 
I will say, I believe that the silver lining in all of this is that it's no longer a taboo topic. Right. We're talking about it today. Like it's, it's our, our case is in our face or like you said, your mess is your message. So here we are together in this giant mess. Now we're aware of it. Let's do something about it. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I appreciate high level people like Simone Biles, for instance, and, and other elite athletes who are, are coming forward and who are prioritizing their mental health because it, it gives us, the rest of us, permission to do the same. There used to be this massive shame and stigma associated with mental and emotional challenges, uh, burnout, right? You know, as you were bad, stupid, lazy, oh, you want to take a break? Yeah. You know, it goes, or you don't have what it takes, or you're just a failure. Right? These were the, the, the phrases that, that swam around, you know, because of our society's expectations. So this is a beautiful opportunity to have this conversation. So thank you so much, Jess, for, for having it. Now, how stress can lead to mental and emotional health challenges is that to start out with, we are all hardwired with our own unique response to stress and acute stress. And in fact, okay, we're not that different from animals, right? When, when a gazelle is, is faced with, say, you know, about to be chased by a lion, right? What does the gazelle do? It runs. In other words, it's hardwired to run because that's what it does best. A honey badger will like turn around and, and fight. It doesn't care if, you know, whatever's chasing it is 10 times bigger than it is. In other words, it, it's hardwired to fight. A rabbit shivers in fear or a deer is like kind of caught, like we always you know the phrase, a deer caught in the headlights, right? Or a possum will like play dead, right? We humans are the same way and there's no right or wrong. It's giving yourself, I love that phrase, the grace to understand that you're not an awful person. When acute stress, like in other words, when your unconscious mind perceives that there is a threat to you, it may not be a saber toothed tiger or you know, you may not be immediately in danger of your life. Your unconscious mind doesn't know that because it doesn't think. All your thinking happens up here in, you know, behind your forehead in your executive rock star team. So your, when you go, when you are faced with an immediate threat within milliseconds, your blood gets shunted to your muscles so that you can run or fight. Your pupils dilate so you can see better. Your heart starts racing so that, again, to start pumping the blood around. It shuts the blood down to organs like your digestive system because that's not where you need it. In other words, it's, everything is what needs to happen now to keep me alive. And that's a very, that's like our superpower, right? Our adrenaline shoots through our body in milliseconds. And then over time, right? The adrenaline wears out. It can, it's, it's only meant to be like that high octane superpower for like a very short time. And if the stress continues, then your cortisol hormone ramps up and hormones take a little longer like hours to days and so it will it will take longer but when it gets going it it does the same job its whole purpose is to keep you alive right it's not worried about long term effects so the cortisol hormone messes with your sleep and it causes you to gain weight and 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 while all of this is happening, remember I said your executive rock star team is offline, right? Because that's not the time to be thinking. When you're faced with a threat for survival, which is what your unconscious mind thinks, whether it's your boss calling you into the office or you know, wondering whether you're going to be able to pay your mortgage, it's, 
it's still a life or death threat as far as your unconscious mind is concerned. And, and so one of the things that your executive rock star team does is it tamps down the emotions, right? So you can focus and concentrate when you need to. Mm-hmm. And that's offline. So all of a sudden you're like the Hulk and like, and you're like, flying off the handle at your, your family, your loved ones, maybe your boss, or you're crying at the drop of a hat. (laughs) So this is why our emotions can be so volatile. And we see it worldwide right now, don't we? Yeah, totally. Especially like on social media. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, this is where our emotions start to to go out of whack, potentially. And that is because we are the only animals who who prolong the stress ourselves, right? So whatever, I think the stat is we spend about 55% of our time dwelling on the past, which is usually the negative past, right? The traumas, the adversities, the fight we had with our spouse earlier, or, you know, 40% of the time worried about the future, like whether, you know, we're going to be able to afford to pay the mortgage or whether we're going to still have a job at the end of the month. Or, or will we survive? Or will we survive? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so we're already, even before COVID, we're already in that space where we were, chronic stress mm-hmm. was the pandemic. Yeah. Really, and and the mental and emotional health challenges are the manifestations of it. So then you add COVID, you know, long haul COVID, COVID fatigue, COVID exhaustion, right? It's we have been going and going and going, and we're getting worn out, and our reserves, our energy reserves are being worn down and used up. So there is no buffer for us. And it just seems like we're constantly in survival mode, right? So that is why I say (laughs) globally, you can say billions are in burnout right now, Mm -hmm. except I will say I have coined the term flameout syndrome because burnout is only supposed to mean workplace related and only mental and emotional. Well, so will you tell us a little bit about what, what's the difference between burnout and flameout syndrome? Burnout was coined by a Dr. Freudenberger back in like the seventies. And he described it as workplace related because that's how it was for him and how it showed up for him was the mental and emotional. And, and that was continued. Dr. Christina Maslach did a really great uh, burnout risk assessment. The world health organization still to this day says that burnout is only workplace related and only deals with mental and emotional sequelae is the official term, like the techie term. Whereas I know that mine wasn't just workplace related. It was being a single mom, mm-hmm. trying to be superwoman, right? In other words, and just as we've found with COVID, it's life ha- throws curveballs, right? Whether it's your family member getting COVID or you, or life goes on, you know, maybe you're one of your parents gets Alzheimer, your child falls down and breaks a leg. Like, these things still happen. Yeah. Right. So you can't tease out. So that's why I created the term, coined the term flame out syndrome. You can look at it as catastrophic burnout because if you ignore the mental and emotional signs, you are headed down that slippery slope to physical burnout as I did. And it's also deals with that. It's, it recognizes that the chronic stress can happen in any part of our life, not just workplace. So what, what can happen? Like your case was extreme. You, you literally blacked out and, and crashed your car and 
and, and you were, you were close to killing yourself and, and your children, like, because of this stress, like what are some other scenarios that are, that are possible and that, that you've seen in, in your line of work with this flame out syndrome? Cause I know you work with a lot of high performance, high driving, a type individuals who operate at a level of, of chronic stress, <laughs> chronic, you know, desire to always achieve, always accomplishing, you know, the next milestone and whatnot, but they don't ever typically get a rest or, or a break. Um, so what, what have you seen, um, show up for different people? And I know you said earlier, you know, we're all, we're all individual and it's, it's going to manifest differently, but what, what are some of the like most common scenarios that, that you've seen, um, bubble up for people? <clears throat> Great question. So it does show up differently for everyone. And, and think of it in terms of what is your weak link? Okay. Right. So when it comes to how it manifests, it will be like, how does it show up? And it may be tied to your genetics. Like in other words, if diabetes runs in your family, yeah. Right it may manifest as diabetes. Okay. Okay. Um, And I want to back up and say that mental and emotional health challenges are like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to chronic stress and burnout or flame out syndrome. And, and by that, in case any of your listeners don't know what that phrase means, Up until the late 1980s, coal miners, unfortunately, would take a canary in a cage down into the mine with them because the canary was more sensitive to toxic fumes than the coal miners. So if the canary stopped singing or keeled over, then the miners knew that they had to get out neck, you know, right away because otherwise they would be next. So the mental and emotional, this is why it's so important that we help people now with this, because if we don't, the physical manifestations are next in line. Yeah. So, so yes, chronic stress can lead to increased blood sugar and insulin resistance. And that of course leads to diabetes, the increased heart rate, the increased blood pressure, can lead to cardiovascular disease. The the cortisol hormone that we talked about, remember its sole job was to keep you alive now. Mm -hmm. Long-term, it depresses your immune system. So it can, can manifest, unfortunately, as cancer. It can manifest as as autoimmune conditions. Mm-hmm. And those are, those are seemingly to like be increasing, you know, just across the population right now because of our toxic environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it leads to increased infections, especially viral infections. Okay. Do we know of a viral infection yeah. that we need to be strong against? Yeah. We've got a pandemic flu going around right now. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So, so the very things that we need to be strong about Mm -hmm. are (laughs) long-term are going to come back and bite us in the butt. You're right. Mine happened because I had adrenal exhaustion, which led to actually low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, which caused me to lose consciousness. And it was bad luck, whatever you want to call it, that it happened while I was driving. Yeah. Right. So the important thing to know is that over 60% of adults, even before COVID, had some kind of chronic condition. And many more have, many of them had more than one chronic condition because they tend to go together. Like diabetes also causes cardiovascular disease. And when you look at the world's top killers, even before COVID, the top killers were either directly caused by chronic stress or greatly aggravated by it. And they kill more people than COVID has, right? So again, that that is a slow burn 
of a pandemic that was always ignored. And it's not just me saying this. I remember sitting in a dinner uh, presentation by a psychiatrist and he was talking about, and this was pre-COVID, he was talking about anxiety and depression and telling the family doctors in the audience that if they didn't adequately address these conditions and challenges with their patients now, 20 years down the road, those would be the patients showing up with diabetes, heart disease, cancer, right? So it was recognized before, and we are going to see that more and more and more. So it really truly is, you know, what is your weak link? And, and understand that it's time to make a change now. Don't wait to hit the wall like I did. Yeah. Now is the time to, to take the steps and recognize the stress and the strain that you've been under. Thank you. <clears throat> so I know, uh, I know you've got some, some SOS tools that you use to support people once they've identified what the weak link is and they're ready to do the work and they're ready to take back control over their mental and emotional health and they want to you know, um, process this stress or these really tough emotions appropriately. Can you talk about some of your most favorite techniques or tools that you use to help people, um, reclaim their life and, and, you know, feel more balanced? That's a beautiful way of saying it. That is what's behind when I talk about shifting from stress to success. Because when you are in stress or which is also survival mode, you can't be successful. You're not in success mode. And when I talk about success, it is in all areas of your life, not just your career and wealth, your health and energy, your relationships, your personal life. Because if anyone says that they, they are successful and yet the other parts of their life are crap, they're deluding themselves. They're lying to themselves. In other words, it's, it's going to come back to bite them. So I am passionate about teaching these SOS tools. In other words, what can you do in a second, in 30 seconds, in a minute, in five minutes to quickly ground and, and center and, and <laughs> calm the alarms going off in your unconscious mind? your emotion center, your, your amygdala, so that you can think straight again, so that you can think logically, come up with creative solutions, make good decisions and actually act on those good decisions. And, you know, put the, you know, put the Hulk back in <laughs> where he belongs and, and, and leave the crying so that you can actually focus on what you're doing. I'm not against crying. I'm just saying, you'll know who you are, right? If you're like, I don't understand what's happening with me. Right. Right. So one of the first things is, and I love to teach this, is your actions create your feelings. Your actions create your feelings. And, and by that, I mean that your body language not only speaks to other people in volumes, it speaks to yourself and more importantly, your brain, your mind. So if you are slumped and you're tired and you're like this, and you got a frown on your face and, and just, right, how does that make you feel? Do you feel bad? <laughs> right. Yeah. Versus sitting or standing up straight. Shoulders down, away from your ears, not like this. If you can see the, the video, shoulders down, just allow them to drop down. Chin up, put a smile on your face, stick a pencil in between your teeth if you need. I usually have a pencil and I don't, but you go like this, like do whatever it takes to put a smile on your face and look straight forward. Don't look down, look straight forward. And how does that make you feel? Instantly, I, I feel I feel 
stronger. I feel more powerful. My shoulders are back. Um, yeah, it feels, it, I just feel better doing that versus the hunch, the slump. Yeah. So there's a reason why the military spends so much time drilling into their new recruits posture. It's not just to give them something to do. It's because they understand that they need to, to take these newbies, to say it lovingly, and turn them into strong, confident soldiers who are willing to rush into the heat of battle, even possibly risking their lives. Right. <clears throat> right. So, and that's what posture does. And it's even smiling compared to frowning. When you smile, even if you're not feeling like it right at the time, it the message goes from those smile muscles that are activated to your brain, sending the message, oh, she must be happy. So I'm going to release some happy neurotransmitters. I'm going to release some oxytocin, some, some serotonin, and serotonin is what they give you when you're depressed, right? So when, you, when you're smiling, right, just something so similar, even if you, my, my clients all know, right, and I have whole families that I've worked with, and they have like a saying, stick a pencil in it. In other words, if you stick a pencil between your teeth, it forces you into a smile, <laughs> Try it. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I love that because that's such a simple free technique that you can use immediately to start your brain to kick in some of the, the release of some of those happy chemicals. So just literally you just do this. Right. Because right. when you are doing that, neurotransmitters change in milliseconds. Right? It's the same milliseconds that happen when the stress response starts. Okay. Right. So this is milliseconds, forget even seconds, milliseconds. And that same message goes to the primitive part of your brain, to the emotion center, the amygdala, which is that five alarm center. Mm -hmm. And it calms it down and goes, Hey, everything's all good. It's all good in here. I did not know that smiling will release free, happy chemicals in your brain. I, I did not know that. That's amazing. <laughs> And the other beautiful part about it is because, and it also goes with thinking happy thoughts, gratitude. Yeah, gratitude's huge. List five things that you're grateful for. If you can only think of one thing, think that over and over and over again. And if you believe that you have nothing to be grateful for, go back to big generalities that are absolute fact. I'm grateful the sun came up this morning and we're not in supernova. I'm grateful that I have clean water to drink, that I have, I have food to eat, that I have clean air to, to breathe. And hopefully your listeners have that, right? So in other words, go back to basics. Your life can be going to pot, to hell in a handbasket, and you can always find something to be grateful for. And if anybody disagrees with me, maybe you won't disagree with this person. One of my heroes is Dr. Viktor Frankl, who survived four Holocaust death camps, had everything taken from him, his family, his profession. You know, he was treated like an animal and he was in constant fear for his life. And even Dr. Viktor Frankl said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, his ability to think and respond in any given situation. So in other words, there's always something that you can be grateful for. No matter how big the trauma or adversity you may be going through, you can at least be grateful that it has given you the opportunity to hone your mental, emotional, energetic, spiritual character, your strength, your endurance, your flexibility, and your balance. And so that's another big part of what I talk with people about is that what you think matters. What you say 
matters. Little things can give you back control when you feel like life is spiraling out of control. Our, and our words, they have so much power. Think about how, how do we normally talk, Jess? I have to go to the grocery store. I have to work two jobs to pay for this $10 gas or put my kids through school or to buy groceries. No, you don't have to do anything. If somebody hasn't drugged you, you may not like your choices, but you always have choice and control. So even just changing to, I'm going to the grocery store feels better than I have to go, right? Because you're, you're telling your unconscious mind you're in victim, right? Right. How about I get to go to the grocery store? Yes. Yes, totally. That's very empowered. Right. I get to work two jobs to put food on the table because guess what? There's so much, so many parts of the world that don't have that food to put on the table. And you have two employers who want you there. Like it's not, you have choice. Exactly. You're in need. You're yeah. Right. So when, so the very act of changing your thought patterns, your word patterns changes, you know, shifts you from being the victim of your story to being the hero of your story. Right. So, and, and victim is, and that powerlessness is where the anxiety, the overwhelm, the worry, the fear lives. And I'm not saying it's a panacea. I have like tons more tools and it's a start. It's a start. And if you can start catching yourselves over and over and over again, it will become slowly habit and make a game. If you have like family members around, make it a game with them. Like before bed, when you first wake up in the morning, list five things you're grateful for to get you off on the right foot. I do this with clients where they'll be like, oh, you wouldn't believe I, I, this, this thing happened and my spouse or my boss. And I'm like, okay, tell me five good things. about. there is no good thing. <laughs> Choose one good, one thing you're grateful of. And if, if they honestly can't find that, I say, make one up. <laughs> Make one up. I'm so grateful that my boss is so supportive. In other words, make it up and put a smile on your face while you are saying it. So those are things that can make a difference in a millisecond or seconds. And you also mentioned tapping. Because of my acupuncture background, I have pulled together different disciplines. So the Tapping World Summit uh, happens every year. It's really great. It's based on emotional freedom technique, which is like an amalgamation of psychology and tapping on acupuncture points. I do that and I come at it from the energetic and the acupuncture side of it. So I look at the actual meridians and which points are the most powerful on those and the negative emotions that are associated with each meridian. So for instance, since we were talking fear. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> so if we have time, I'll go through Yeah, this. let's do it. Let's do this. So there are a number of points that I highly recommend, and I'm going to describe, number one, I'll quickly say there are five main fears that all other fears live under. And I, I'm a geek when it comes to English, so I put Ds with them, the five Ds of fear. So the first, makes sense, death. Yep. Second one, disability, Right. I think we can all agree on that one. Third one, destitution. I had to come up with a, a less common name. It means going, you know, fear of going bankrupt, not having enough, right? Um, not enough broke. money, yeah. not enough food, right? So in other yeah. words, those first three are survival, okay. right? And make total sense. The next two are even more powerful 
and perhaps harder to understand, more challenging to understand. The fourth D is fear of desertion. This is fear of rejection, fear of humiliation, embarrassment, loss of connection or love, right? And love and connection are an essential emotional need. So this is why people will stay in, say, unhealthy relationships, even if they're unhappy and, and maybe they're, they're, it's an abusive relationship even. It's because they are afraid to lose that connection, okay? And the fifth one is the most challenging one to understand, and that is the fear of the death of your identity, like who you are, which I, I spend whole workshops going through this. Suffice it to say that your identity is the combination of your programming, of your memories, of those transformational life events, negative and positive, trauma, could be getting married, having a baby, right? In other words, they're not just negative. It's where your identity shifts like that, right? Any parent, mom or dad will say that, okay, I was, I was a free and easy person here by myself, even if I was married. And once that baby was born, I was automatically a dad. I was automatically a mom. Right? In other words, those are those life-changing events. So you're programming what's role modeled for you as well as what you're taught by your family, especially your same-sex parent, your, your community, your religion, perhaps, your culture, your country, right? We all have, there's different programmings that go with that. And then your memories, and then your your transformational life events. So when you, this fear is where people will be like, well, that's not who I am. I, I can't do that. That's not who I am. I can't make a lot of money because my parents didn't, their parents didn't, my whole community didn't. I come from a family of farmers, right? We were like poor as church mice. Right? So when you look at an identity, that can be the most powerful fear of all and the least well understood because it's not logical. We think we want change, but our unconscious mind will be going like, heck no. Because guess where your identity is housed in your unconscious mind. So those are the fears. So go back to the points. Here's the end of the stomach meridian under your eye. You like follow your eye down to your cheekbone. There's a divot there. In acupuncture, we love divots. Just saying. And this, the emotion that's associated with this is fear, fear of not enough. So it's scarcity. It could be cravings, even physical cravings. This is really great if you're trying to stop cravings and lose weight or even release addictions. But it's also envy and greed. In other words, it's that, that fear that there's not enough to go around. So you can see how that might play out in your life. Or, you know, I'll, I'll say my parents, you know, raised in the depression, and they, <laughs> they were so afraid that they would never have enough food that they had four big, huge chest freezers full of, of food. They had a whole big room of a pantry full of canned goods and they would still go to the grocery store once or twice a week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They were so afraid of not having enough. The next point is one of my favorites. And it's, if you follow your collarbone down towards your breastbone and drop off to the side, another divot, this is the end of your kidney meridian. And the kidney meridian is, has to do with your confidence, your, your belief in I've got what it takes. And if you don't have that on the flip side, it's I don't have what it takes. It's a feeling of inadequacy. And inadequacy is different than 
incompetence. Incompetence just simply means that you don't have the skills. You can learn those. Inadequacy means I'm broken. I'm deficient. I'll never have what it takes. And this is what I call the deeper, darker version of imposter syndrome. Feeling like a fraud. Because deep down inside, you feel, I'll never be good enough. I, I'll never have what it takes. This one is so, so powerful. I would say of all the points, if you're ever in doubt, the breastbone point is the one to go for. And you, people don't even need to know you're doing it. That's the beautiful part, right? You can just be like rubbing here and while you're in a stressful meeting. So do you rub or do you tap? And if you tap, how, how many... Does it matter how many times, like, do you need to count or do you just lightly do it? No, I mean, and you'll often find me like I'll, I'll I just automatically do it now. And okay. this is one thing I recommend is that while these are powerful in the moment, the more you can practice them when you're not in that massive survival, you know, life or death mode, yeah, the better, because then it can become habit, right? And you don't have to think about it. what, what did Dr. Irene say I was supposed to do again? Right. 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 So, so, so you can tap, you can rub, you're still going to, to get the, the effect. And ideally I'll just say, you know, three deep breaths. If you can only manage one breath, it's still better than nothing. Do you do both sides or just one side or does it matter? <clears throat> You do, it doesn't really matter. And this is one of those few points that you can do both. It's easy to do both. Okay. At the same time, it's kind of hard to like go like this on your cheekbones, right? Well, if you're in a meeting, that's a little hard. <laughs> exactly. That's why I, I said, this is a great one to do. Okay. Okay. So this is, I've got what it takes got versus it takes. feeling inadequate. Okay. So that's a nice mantra. I like that. I've got what it takes because it that takes. is, that's the resilience talking, right? I've got yeah. what it takes no matter what curve balls life throws at me. I love that. Right. The next one is under the arm. You can't really see. I'll try and stand up here a little bit more. It's, it's under the arm on the side, bra line for the ladies, nipple line for the guys. And you just kind of look like a teapot. This is a more challenging one to do in a meeting. Doesn't mean you can't. Yeah, you got it. You got it. This is the end of the spleen meridian. And the spleen meridian is all about insecurity and fear of the future. Right. So this speaks to, it can be your financial future. It can be your health. It can be your relationships. Right. So this one is a very, very powerful point. So yeah. You had it. It's trying to get up here higher so you guys can see it. All right. <laughs> you got it. You, you got it, Jess. You're doing better than I am with this. <laughs> so, so that is very, very powerful when there's fear and insecurity about the future. Okay. That's very helpful. What's a good mantra to say when you're working on that area? All right. You can say, I have... Let me, let's, let me come up with a fast one here, a, a powerful one. I know I'll be fine no matter what. Oh, that's beautiful. I know I'll be fine no matter what. I know I'll be fine no matter what. Okay. Speaking of, so, and also the kidney meridian, the breastbone, that's like anxiety, overwhelm. Okay. Okay. Right. So you don't have to say these words, right? When you are in that moment and you're feeling, right, the thoughts are thinking you, the emotions are feeling you, you know what I mean, right, Jess? Yeah. It's like, you don't have to like come up with words, just, just start rubbing or tapping. Okay. The next one is if you follow your eyebrow out to the end, the outside, Okay. This is the end of the triple heater meridian. This is the negative emotion associated with this is hopelessness and despair. 
right? It's never going to get better. It's only going to get worse. It's no use. This is a great one for people dealing with grief. Yes, this is huge for grief, depression, depressed mood. Keeping in mind, as you said before at the beginning, Jess, this is not a a substitution for, for appropriate medical care. Right, right. Hopelessness and despair outside of the eyebrow, the triple yeah. heater meridian. Okay. What's a, what's a mantra or a positive affirmation that we could say that would go along with, um, with the triple heater? <clears throat> this is about hope. Like I have hope. Yeah. I have hope and faith. Mm, I like that faith. I have hope and faith. I have hope and faith. And what, what do you think we should say for the, for the stomach? For the first one. I am content. I am content. Okay. The next one, I, I could have done this at the same time as the kidney, the breastbone, is if you come to the middle of your breastbone and tap or rub there, this one's about jealousy, right? And, and jealousy, the root of jealousy is fear. Jealousy, envy, it's insecurity. So if you're feeling jealousy, don't beat yourself up. Just go, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that's trying to tell me. And you can tap or rub there. Okay. And, and what would be a, a good mantra for that? Like, I, I have enough. I am enough. Yeah. Perfect, Jess. I am enough. Okay. In fact, you can tap both of these, both the kidney and the, the middle of the breastbone at the same time, right? And I am enough. I've got what it takes. I love that. I am enough. I've got what it takes. Yeah. I've got what it takes. One advantage that the speaking does that I didn't mention before is that when you use your voice box, whether it's because you're singing like no one's listening, you know, putting on some great up, lifting tunes or talking, it actually activates the vagus nerve, which is your rest and digest nerve. Okay. So when you are speaking it, if you're able to, or speak, saying anything, right. Sing happy birthday or twinkle, twinkle, little star, if you need to, right. Or your favorite song. So long as it's an uplifting song, right? You want to keep it positive. So those are very, very powerful. And the final one that I'm going to give you, because we were talking about grief, is the side of the hand. In EFT, they talk about the karate chop. The actual point is if you crick your little finger right underneath the, the knuckle where the wrinkles form, that is small intestine feet. Three, not feet. Three, small intestine three. And the negative emotion associated with this is sadness and grief. It's like loss, sadness, grief. So the positive would be joy. So what would you, what would you say for, for a mantra? Like I can, I, I can be joy. I can find joy. I can have joy. Or is that too far of a stretch when you're feeling sad and grief to even, to even get there? <clears throat> so when you are, there's a reason why in emotional freedom technique, they use what are called setup phrases and they start it right here on the karate chop point, as they call it. And they'll say, even though I have all this fear, I love and accept myself anyway. Even though I have all this fear, I love and accept myself. Okay. <clears throat> Even though I'm feeling overwhelmed, like life is being done to me, 
I love and accept myself. So even though I'm I'm feeling sad and I've lost so much, I love and accept myself. Right. Okay. Even though I'm afraid my old life is completely gone. And I'm so afraid of what the future is going to hold. I love and forgive myself and anyone else who may have contributed to this. And so what that does, it's, it sounds strange and, and your, your listeners may be like, well, that's like lame or frou-frou. Remember the unconscious mind has no logic and you're speaking to your unconscious mind because the unconscious mind is like the wizard of Oz, little man behind the curtain, the fingers at the controls, right? It has the ultimate power and it's in control 99% of the time. And logic lives up here. Remember your executive rock star team behind your forehead. The unconscious mind is, has about the mentality and maturity of a five-year-old, right? So when you use the setup phrases and when you tap on these powerful points, remember just like the smile muscle, it's sending the message to your unconscious mind. And they've shown on functional MRI that it calms the alarms going off in your emotion center, your amygdala, okay? So that you can, okay, so that you're, executive rock star team can kick back online so that you can think straight and you can make good decisions and you can act on those good decisions. The very things that you likely need to get you out of the pickle that you're in. So the, that's why these are so important. So this, even though really speaks to that feeling of betrayal. Yeah. Yeah that feeling of betrayal that there's, there's <laughs> life is being done to me, or maybe it's pain or you're feeling right. Often our self judgment and like, we're more angry at ourselves and others. Okay. So, so this speaks to that, that even though I've, I've lost everything, I still love and accept myself. No, it's, it's taking, it's giving yourself that grace. I think that's so important. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the feeling of betrayal too, because a lot of people are feeling betrayed by their government. They're feeling betrayed by um, politicians. They're feeling betrayed by employers. They're feeling betrayed by friends or family. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, very complex emotions here. And I really appreciate... Um, you know, this framework that you gave us with the the five D's of fear, because I, I think that we've all, all five of these um, aspects of fear that you mentioned have been activated for all of us for the most part over the last couple of years. So the, the death of identity of who you are. So maybe you start to, you know, <sighs> figure out that you've been lied to about some things. And that's, that's really hard to reconcile when, like you said, your identity was based on knowledge or information or programming that you've had and you have to untangle that. And then you're like, okay, if I've, if I've been lied to and now I'm feeling these feelings of betrayal, what do I do? And then desertion, a lot of people over the last couple of years have lost connections with loved ones and, in, you know, employment situations that they were really passionate about. And because they were focused on their own, you know, they were grounded in their morals and values and, and individual freedoms. They, they lost a lot. We have, um, destitution, you know, having, having, you know, significant financial loss, um, disability. A lot of people have become disabled over the last couple of years. And it wasn't something that they were, they were anticipating would ever be a reality for them. And, and we've all dealt with death too, you know, and we've, most of us have, have, you know, 
either had somebody close to us or somebody that we know or a friend of a friend who's passed on here. So all of these fears um, are really heightened for the collective. And um, I'm just really grateful for you, Irene, for sharing these techniques with us today because um, while, while they are simple, they're so powerful. And I, what I really appreciate about them is that they can help ground you in the present moment and bring you back to yourself and bring you back to your true nature. And I loved um, your sharing about Viktor Frankl and you know um, about always having the ability to make a choice and, and continue to make decisions in your own life. And that's a very powerful place to be and very empowering when you know and you're clear about what your morals, your values, and your standards are. So um, thank you so much. And I, I, I really appreciate your reminding us about um, inviting grace back into our lives, inviting grace back in towards ourselves and towards others. And I think, you know, we need to, we need to talk more about this and we need to understand more about the power of grace and the power of faith, you know, and, and I, I really love this conversation about resiliency because, um, it's so desperately needed at this time. Um, I know there's another modality <laughs> and, and we're, I, I want to be respectful of your time here. Um, but there's one more modality I want to ask you a question about because you are an expert in meditation and I'd, I'd love if you could just share a little bit about, um, why meditation is such a powerful tool for us when we're, when we're working on building, um, a foundation of resiliency in our life and we're working through challenging, stressful situations. Mm, thank you. I would love to. And I, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that this will be strange for a meditation instructor to say this. And when you are in survival mode, for the vast majority of people, that is not the time to try meditating, at least sure. conventional meditation because if you think back to our our hardwired survival instincts if your survival instinct is to go into hulk mode hulk smash right <laughs> you know he's racing flat out yeah. the last thing that a hulk wants you to tell him is like ah oh, go relax you know spend an hour meditating you'll feel so much better yeah. Right. No, <laughs> you're not going to probably smash you. Yeah. yeah. If you say that, if you are anxious and overwhelmed and worried and your mind's going, you're, you know, those thoughts are thinking you, it's like, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right. And somebody says, just meditate. You feel like I can't calm down. I, I can't think straight. Right. And I, was, I can't stop the monkey mind chatter. Right. And so they're not going to be able, they're just going to get more antsy. It's like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Right. So in other words, for most people, that is not the time to start meditating. If you already meditate, that's wonderful. And having said that, that's why I'm passionate as part of my SOS tools and techniques to teach active meditation. In other words, quick, fast, powerful techniques that you can use in seconds or in a couple minutes even to quickly ground and center. And, and they may not even look like meditation. May I show you one? Please. I would love that. Okay. So just start rubbing your hands together. Pretend you're, you know, like back in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, and you're have a stick between your hands. I'm and you're to make fire. <laughs> starting a fire. That's right. And feel the heat build up in your hands. Just feel the heat build up in your hands. And then just allow your hands to separate. And you'll feel tingling on the palms of your hands. And you can even feel a ball of energy in between your palms. And just notice that as you bring your palms farther apart, that ball of energy doesn't get smaller. It actually gets bigger and stronger. Play with that ball of energy and then feel, 
feel the tingling wrap around your palms, your hands, and feel that tingling and heat spread up your forearms, your elbows, your arms, and then feel the tingling start in the soles of your feet. You can feel it, feel the heat build up and the tingling. And now it's wrapping around your feet, moving up, enveloping your calves and shins, your thighs, your buttocks, your torso, your chest, all the way up your back to your shoulders. You're gonna feel your shoulders just dropping away from your ears. And now that tingling and that heat in a beautiful way, spreading up your neck, you can feel like the tingling starting on the tip of your nose. And just allow yourself as much as you can spread out. If you have the room, pretend you're like Da Vinci's man, you know? Spreading out your feet, spreading out your arms, face up towards the heavens. And just move your arms around in an arc, forwards and backwards. And feel like this whole sphere of energy. And you are the origin of that energy because this is your life energy. And this isn't frou-frou. This is your electromagnetic energy that we all emit. This is how they measure EEGs, your brain waves. This is how they measure ECGs, your heart waves, right? And just to feel the beauty and the strength of how it feels to, to really spread yourself out and going back to what we talked about in the beginning, your actions create your feelings. So when you spread yourself out like this, you're like saying, I got this. I got this. I've got this. I love that. Because when we are and we've got here, this here, we tend to want to close down. No, you want to spread out, spread yourself out because your body language talks to you far stronger than it does to anybody else. And that is active meditation. It's a mindfulness. And you can stop just here. Just even doing this. You may see, like, I'm not just cold when I'm in Canada, even the much time I am. <laughs> but it's like just even rubbing your hands together and just really focusing on the heat between your hands is getting you into a present state. And when you are in that present state, you're not worried about what's happening in the future. You're not dwelling on the negative things that happened in the past. You're in the present. And this is where you make the good decisions. Oh, I just so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you so much. This was just beautiful um, and so helpful, so timely, so profound and simple and accessible. Thank you. That's what it's all about. Simple, powerful, easy. Okay. Will you please tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you? So I am on all major platforms, except maybe Pinterest, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I think you're going to have them in the show notes. Yeah. My, uh, I have a YouTube channel that you can go to. That'll be in the, the show notes. I have about 11 meditations on the app Insight Timer. And I'm about to release a course on there as well that is all about tapping into success mode. And where can we find the app? Is it um, iTunes store or what? Yeah, just on in, I, I can't speak for, for Android, but it is, but you go to the app store on your iPhone and okay. it's in there and it's free. There are courses that you can pay a yearly subscription for. And what I love is that there are hundreds of thousands of completely free meditations that you can put in. Okay, I've only got a minute. I need something now. I have a meditation on there that's called the SOS Anxiety Meditation, Active Meditation. 
and it's four minutes long that I have taught to top performers, top athletes to use when they really need to ground and center. In fact, that's also on my YouTube channel. I highly recommend that one because when you practice it, you can learn how to do it yourself in less than a minute. And that app is called the Insight Timer. Yeah, Insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T. Okay. Timer. Got it. Or go to my YouTube channel. So. Great. And then what is your um, what is your website? We'll pop it up here. DrIreneCop.com. So okay. D-R-I-R-E-N-E-C-O-P.com. Perfect. This has been so helpful. Thank you so very much. Do you have any... Um, parting words of wisdom for our audience before we say goodbye for the day. This too shall pass. Lovely. Thank you so much, Irene. We're grateful for you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Jess.